There are big developments tonight with regard to the Russia investigation. We now know that the FBI determined that Attorney General Jeff Sessions did nothing wrong with regard to the meetings that he had with the Russian ambassador. They said they were routine. They came to that conclusion on March 7th of this year, just five days after the AG recused himself from the investigation. So that's interesting timing, isn't it? And it raises new questions about why Jeff Sessions felt that he needed to recuse himself at all. We are also learning tonight that a judge in the Michael Flynn case is no longer on that case. Also tonight, brand new fallout in the media. Late today, CNN was forced to walk back a story about Donald Trump Jr. Earlier this week, Brian Ross and ABC had to do the same. In both stories, it had to do with the timing and the details, which are important in these cases. And it all adds some fuel, you would say, to the fire in the White House argument that this whole thing is not a fair fight for them. So we're going to get to that with the panel in just a moment. But first, Chief Washington Correspondent Ed Henry, live at the White House with what happened today. Good evening, Ed. Martha, good to see you. What a week it has been, both for hyped-up news stories uh, that are putting President Trump in a negative light that turned out to be bogus, on top of a series of stunning developments that suggest maybe people around the president are not getting a fair shake in the Russia investigation. The latest example tonight, the judge overseeing the case involving retired General Michael Flynn has now recused himself from the matter without explanation. Court documents showing that Judge Rudolph Contreras has now removed himself from the case, but he only did so after Flynn pleaded guilty before Contreras in federal court for lying to the FBI, raising questions about why he did not reveal that beforehand. That move follows several other problems for special counsel Robert Mueller this week that have increased concerns about whether the investigation is fair. New tonight, the Wall Street Journal report, reporting that Mueller's top deputy, Andrew Weissman, attended Hillary Clinton's election night party, yes, at the Javits Center in New York. Remember, earlier this week, we learned Weissman had emailed then-acting Attorney General Sally Yates early this year when she defied President Trump over his travel ban, writing, quote, I am so proud and in awe. Thank you so much. All my deepest respects. On top of FBI agent Peter Stroke having to be pulled from Mueller's probe because he had sent text messages to his girlfriend that were anti-Trump and were cheerleading for Hillary Clinton. After Stroke had served as lead agent in the Clinton email probe and got then FBI Director James Comey to shift his summation from saying Clinton was, quote, grossly negligent, which hinted at potential crimes, to the more lenient, extremely careless. Now we learn tonight that despite several media reports earlier this year suggesting Attorney General Jeff Sessions may have been in hot water for not revealing his contacts with the Russian ambassador on an important security clearance form, an FBI email marked March 7th, that date is important, shows that Sessions was under no obligation to reveal those contacts unless he, quote, developed personal relationships with ambassadors from Russia or anywhere else. And here's why that's important. Just a few days earlier on March 2nd, Jeff Sessions put out a statement saying he was recusing himself from any investigations involving the 2016 campaign because of his role supporting President Trump. Now, the FBI email uh, basically comes in five days later saying there was no problem with you failing to disclose this contact with the Russian ambassador on this form. Remember, when Sessions recused himself, that led to the appointment, yes, of Robert Mueller. Martha? Indeed it did. Um, and Ed, you know, obviously that's something that the president's been upset about since it happened. And it exactly. raises, you know, one question is, as the head of the Department of Justice, if he was considering recusing himself based you know, among other things, on these meetings that he had, because that had just been a big story, all of that had come out, and he felt perhaps it didn't look good for him. Yeah. Um, you know, why wouldn't someone at the FBI had said, you know, we're working on this investigation, we don't really see any problem with those meetings, just so you know, before you do this? Right. Well, in Jeff Sessions' defense and why he recused himself, he would probably argue, because he's talked about this before, that it wasn't just about that form the FBI was evaluating in terms of his security clearance. It was also his testimony uh, before Al Franken and other members of the Senate Judiciary Committee and whether he fully answered truthfully. There was a lot of pressure uh, on Jeff Sessions. But if you're President Trump tonight and you're hearing that five days after your attorney general recused himself, the FBI said, well, that contact with the Russian ambassador really wasn't that big of a deal. The anger that President Trump has had before about the recusal leading to the Mueller mm. uh, appointment 
is only going to get a little it's hotter. likely bubbling Martha. back up again. Ed, thank you so much, Ed Appreciate Henry, tonight at the White House for us. So joining me now, Carl Rove is former Deputy Chief of Staff for President George W. Bush and a Fox News contributor. Adrian Elrod served as Strategic Communications Director for the 2016 Clinton presidential campaign, uh, and they both join me now. Last to chew over tonight. Thanks so much for both of you for being here. Thanks, uh, you know, with regard to this uh, CNN report, I just want to put up the statement from CNN's Brian Stelter. Um, he said that a CNN and spokes, spokeswoman says there will be no disciplinary action in this case because unlike Brian Ross, ABC, MK Raju followed the editorial standards process. Multiple sources provided him with the incorrect info. When, when you put these stories together this week, though, Carl, you know, what do they say about perhaps um, a propensity to, to jump to judgment without checking all the numbers yeah. and dates, which are crucially important in the story? Well, it shows the danger of trying to be uh, in a rush to be the first. Uh, CNN broke the story. It was then followed by CBS. And ironically enough, the media outlet that corrected them both and blew the whistle on this was the Washington Post, yeah. which said, you got the dates wrong. You're making you're conflating this, making it look like it's something that it's not. So uh, it, it, it's a problem in the media culture in which we live where everybody feels like they got to be the first. And particularly if it sounds like it's anti-Trump, then some media outlets are, are, are quick to rush through it. But it is an irony. CNN made the mistake. CBS quickly followed. And the people who set him straight were the Washington Post. Yeah. Uh, Brian Ross got a four week suspension without pay for his error. Uh, in the CNN case, they are not doing that. They feel uh, that their reporter was, you know, that, that, that they fixed it in time and that, that that's going to be enough. Adrian, you know, when you look at that and then you look at sort of the larger context of the stories that we've talked so much about this week with mm -hmm. regard to the Mueller team and their conflicts and, you know, being. Uh, like Weisman, for example, who was at the Hillary Clinton party, uh, which turned out to not be much of a party that night, um, and all of their obvious support for her. Do you see that a as a problem as an American who wants to make sure that this is a fair system? Well, no, ab absolutely. I mean, first of all, uh, going back to what happened with CNN, it is critically important. There are so many moving parts in this investigation. It's critically important that every media outlet um, make sure that they check all the boxes, you know, dot the I's, cross the T's before they go up with something. There's a lot of competition out there, um, and accuracy is incredibly important, um, especially when we're not even looking at this. Um, at least in my view, it shouldn't always be a Democrat versus a Republican issue. We need to make sure that we as Americans uh, protect ourselves from ever being under the influence of an adversarial government, again, in terms of influencing our electoral process. Um, but secondly, look, I mean, there are a lot of moving parts in this investigation, but you see a lot of Republicans now who praised Mueller when he, when he was initially appointed to oversee this in, uh, investigation independently. And now people are saying, oh, wait, we don't think he's fair. We think he's too biased when this is just, again, another, another example of Republicans trying to create chaos in a situation, uh, given the fact that Mueller yeah. is getting closer and closer to determining the, uh, to getting to the bottom of, the, of this investigation. You know, it's not so much about Mueller, Carl, as it is about some of the people that he chose to put on this team. And I think everyone feels that you can feel however you want about candidates and who you support. Um, but it just raises the question, if you feel that strongly, are you the right person for this investigation? Yeah. Look, I have confidence in Bob Mueller. I'm one of those people who at the beginning uh, complimented the cho choice. I still have confidence in him. But Peter Strzok removed in July. We find out about it in December. Uh, uh, Bruce Orr removed in the Justice Department. Uh, uh, he, for having met with uh, Steele, the mm -hmm. uh, a Brit who was behind the so-called dossier. Uh, mm -hmm. Andrew Weissman. Of the 15 attorneys that we know are involved in the Mueller ex uh, a investigation, nine of them are political contributors and all of them are Democrats. So I, I thought Kim Strassel had a terrific column today in the Wall Street Journal. Mm -hmm. And her recommendation was that in order to keep confidence, to build confidence in his investigation, uh, Mueller needed to uh, have someone whose job it was to respond quickly to congressional requests for information and make certain that when things like Peter Strasek happen in July, we don't find out about it in November, people in Congress who are involved in these investigations find out it contemporaneously. Mm -hmm. can, can I correct one other thing, though, in the reporting that we've been talking about here? The recusal of Jeff Sessions, mm -hmm. it is required by law. 
in response to the appointment of Robert Kennedy by John Kennedy as his attorney general and the John Mitchell appointment, the campaign chairman for Richard Nixon, the federal statute requires that if a matter comes up involving the presidential campaign and the attorney general had played a leading role in that campaign as an advisor or participant in the campaign, he must, as a matter of law, recuse himself. And Jeff Sessions, as the first Republican senator to endorse Trump and a senior advisor to President Trump, had no uh, other course of action available to him except to recuse him under the explicit federal statute government. Governing, uh, these kinds of situations. All right. So you feel that, that he made the right choice, even given the fact that they were about to uh, determine sure. that, that these two he, things he were made no mistakes in turning yeah. out those forms. Yeah. Um, and and, and, and I, I would never, knowing Jeff Sessions like I do, I, I would absolutely have total confidence in that there was never anything uh, in his behavior that was incorrect. All right. Um, you know, Adrian, in terms of, of the Orr story this week, you know, just, just as one example of, of people who are close to this story, does it bother you to learn that he had meetings with Glenn Simpson, that he had meetings with Christopher Steele, who came up with that dossier? Because one of the main questions that remains here is whether or not the dossier is, is the document that this investigation was hinged upon. Well, look, there's no proof out there that the dossier is why the FBI opened this investigation in the first place. The FBI opened this investigation because there were clear signs that Russia uh, was, was possibly colluding with the Trump campaign to alter the election results. You know, and secondly, the dossier, I know there's been a lot of criticism, I understand that, but a lot of the information in the dossier is fact-based. And in my view, if anything in the dossier ultimately leads to determining what actually happened in the election to get to the bottom of what happened is, is a good thing. Carl Rove, Adrian Elrod. She, two weeks ago, called for Bill Clinton's uh, resignation. Goes a few weeks without saying anything about Senator Franken until yesterday. Now, that's not to say her decision is wrong, but most people have been discussing this within a framework of if someone does this, it's unacceptable and they should resign. It's unclear in the way she's been describing her actions what that rationale is. So that's the former Hillary Clinton advisor, Philip Raines, hitting back at Democratic Senator Kirsten Gillenbrand for what he believes is a shifting standard on how politicians should respond to harassment allegations. Um, interesting topic and very interesting approach. Fox News contributor Bernie Goldberg out of Miami today. And Bernie, good morning to you. Uh, you you've been watching hey, all this unfold from down there in Florida. What, what, what do you think of his take or... Um, is the issue much broader than that, Bernie? Yeah, well, in Senator Gillibrand's case, I don't think her real target, certainly not her primary target, despite what she says, I don't think it's Al Franken and Bill Clinton, who she said should have resigned office because of sexual misconduct. I don't believe those are her real targets. I think her real target is Donald J. Trump. Bill Clinton was the poster boy for sexual misconduct. Going after him... If you don't go after him, you can't go after anybody. And going after Al Franken was easy because everybody was going after Al Franken. But here's the point, Bill. If, you, if you're silent on Bill Clinton, then you can't go after Donald Trump, who I think is your real target. If she says that Bill Clinton should have resigned because of sexual misconduct charges and Al Franken should resign for the same reason, then connect the dots. Shouldn't Donald Trump resign for sexual misconduct charges? Look, the Democrats need you a plan B. You think that's where they're going then, right? I mean, that's, that's what you're saying. I think, I think this is about politics. I think they need a plan B in case the Russian collusion thing doesn't work. And the plan B is sex. Interesting. Okay. okay. If, so, so if Nick, Conyers had to. Yeah, you, you have Conyers on Wednesday. You got Franken yesterday. You had Trent Franks it, from it, last then, night. Go then ahead. Then why? Then why not? Then why not Bill Clinton? I'm sorry. Then why not Donald Trump? I think that's what it's about. Okay. Uh, Newt Gingrich with Laura Ingram. This was from Wednesday night. I thought the back and forth was interesting. Go ahead and roll this. No, there's no due process. Not if you're zero. if you're accused and you're a man, you're this accused. Is, you're done. This is Venezuela. Cuba. This is every third world banana republic. Let's not have due process. Let's not ask anybody any questions. Let's not have any chance to have a hearing. Let's just lynch him. Because when we get done lynching him, we'll be so pure. We'll feel so good. I don't know how you feel about that. Give me a quick answer on that. Let me, let oh, me, I'm, let I'm me make a I'm, final point. I'm, I'm thrilled that you ran that clip because this is the Republican version of political convenience and hypocrisy. 
if they defend Al Franken, two staunch conservatives defending Al Franken and saying their words that he's the victim of a lynch mob because he's not getting due process, what are they, what are they also saying? That President Trump is the victim of a lynch mob and he's not getting due process. That's a convenient way of defending Donald J. Trump. The people on the left and the people on the right make Machiavelli look like an amateur. They make him look like Rebecca from Sunnybrook Farm. Political, look, principles are either dead or on their deathbed. They're, they're dying. But political convenience and, yeah, even hypocrisy is alive well, and well. I was watching a lot of the coverage on Al Franken's resignation yesterday. And, and liberal commentators were using words that, frankly, we have not heard in this debate so far. It was overkill, they say. Uh, we are the judge and jury. The punishment doesn't fit the crime. And I'm just wondering, what is different with Al Franken to get a reaction like well, that, do you think, Bernie? Well, well a, couple, a couple of possibilities quickly. One is that he may just be likable to the progressives. They may just like him. Oh, he was popular, and want to defend no him. doubt. Yeah, yeah. But another reason is, and I think this is, a, this is something both liberals and conservatives should think about. We don't want to go too far here. There's a big difference between accusations, credible accusations of rape against Bill Clinton when he was attorney general of Arkansas and stuff that Al Franken was doing. It may have been unacceptable. It may have been crude. It may have been unwelcome. But we need, we can't lump everybody into the same category. Okay. Gr grabbing somebody, kissing somebody that doesn't want to be kissed isn't the same as raping somebody who doesn't want to be raped. I heard Tom and Brokaw, that may be part of what this Brokaw is about. I heard Brokaw say this week, no one knows where the lines are. So just, just watch yeah. that and see how that moves. Bernie, thanks. We've got to run. Good to see you on a Friday. Bernie Goldberg. Okay,